way in your life today right now right here in this moment so as our prayer counselors come up we just want to agree in prayer with you we want to believe in a for a miracle with you oh man we believe that God is able he's proven himself time and time and time and time again so let's sing this again you who can your cry.
of God. It's not wasted. I don't want to try to force a direction. Let's just let the Spirit of God speak to you. Oh, Jesus, we're open. We're open, Spirit of God. favorite songs and I love this song so much because it, it reminds me of this uh, phrase or this this actually a section of one of the chapters in C.S. Lewis's book Mere Christianity if you haven't read read this book it's just an amazing book there's a chapter I don't remember what chapter it is but he talks about how God is outside of the way that we see time so like you know we we see everything that we experience as linear so we wonder naturally, how can something good come out of where I am right now? But what he brings to our memory and what he reminds us of is that God is not stuck in that time. He's not wondering whether or not he will gain victory because of what he's done on the cross. He already has victory. And the thing I like about this song is that really it's just our praise between now and the breakthrough. It reminds us that we're just asking for what has already been done. It's such a great perspective. I actually, I, re, I was reminded as we're, we're about to take communion. So before, I guess I can, instead of wasting time here, I can just, if you don't have the elements of communion, just lift up your hands real quick. If you came in today, maybe you missed it, just lift up your hands and we got ushers are gonna try to get that to you. So we're gonna take communion together as a church. Get that, you can go ahead and get that ready and crack open those couple lids. But there's a, there's a scripture in Colossians 2 that I, it's one of my favorite scriptures. And I love this passage because it reminds us that what Jesus did on the cross happened once for all time. It says this in verse 13 of, of Colossians 2. You were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ for he forgave all our sins. Yeah. He canceled the record of charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, by his death on the cross, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. When I love what this verse is saying is not that not only did Jesus make a way not only did he make us right and make a way where there seemed to be no way but he embarrassed the enemy he shamed their attempts to bring us down he shamed the attempts of the enemy to stop you in your tracks yeah. to kill your potential to kill your purpose by what he did on the cross not only did he give you new life but he embarrassed the works of the enemy that's why this that's why this moment of communion is so powerful Jesus said to do this in remembrance of me. Little did we know what that would mean for us. Little did we know, did the disciples know what that would mean. We, you know, they, they thought and they understood, they believed, they hoped that Jesus would come start a war and overthrow governments. But what we see now, looking back, is that Jesus overthrew something. But he didn't just come to overthrow government is established by man but he came to overthrow the power and the curse of sin on every one of our lives and he flipped that to where that has there's no longer any power of sin in our lives you are free today even if you don't feel free even if you don't feel like you've had a breakthrough it's there yeah. we trust in the name of Jesus the name above every other name the name above what you're worrying about and what you're fearing right now Jesus did it by his victory over sin and death at the cross so today when we take communion, 
That's what we're remembering, that we are victors, not because of anything we've done, but because of what Jesus has already done. Amen? So let's take that first section. And then, you know, Jesus tells the disciples, he breaks his bread and he tells the disciples to do this, break bread together, remembering that this is my body, which is broken for you, for the healing of humanity. His body was broken so our bodies could be made whole. So if you're dealing with something today, a sickness in your body or something wrong in your physical body, that there is newness available to us when we trust in Jesus because of what he did on the cross. His body was broken so we could be made whole. Let's take the bread and remind, remember Jesus broken for us. The next thing that happened that night is they took a cup of wine and Jesus painted a picture for the disciples and for all of us that this cup that I also want you to take, remembering me, it represents my blood being poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Now to us, this culture might not completely understand that, but his disciples in this Jewish culture and specifically the time that Jesus goes to the cross during Passover week, it represented the ultimate sacrifice for sin. In Jewish culture, there was a constant sacrifice of animals to atone for the sins of humanity, to atone for the sins of the people. And Jesus came once and for all to shed his perfect sinless blood so that you would be forever forgiven and given an opportunity to walk with God as intended in the garden. Like there is now a freedom available to us from sin because of Jesus' blood being poured out for us. He suffered so you don't have to. He paid it so you don't have to. We accept that gift. So right now as we take the juice that represents the blood of Jesus poured out, let's remember his body, his blood being poured out for us. Jesus, we take this moment right now and we don't want to ever make light of it. We recognize that tragedy it was that you were murdered on a cross that it was ultimately our sin that sent you to the cross and while we reflect on that and we are grateful for the sacrifice that you made for us today we celebrate because you set us free so right now in this moment of freedom we just say thank you so much Thank you so much. And we choose right now not to squander our freedom, but to embrace our freedom that you paid for. So as we continue to worship our song and what we lift up to you is in gratefulness. It's in thanksgiving of the sacrifice that you made for us to draw in close, to be close to the heart of the Father. We thank you for this moment in Jesus' name. Amen.
welcome you into this place. Your presence and your spirit is so thick and rich among us, God, and we thank you for coming here. Lord, we, we thank you for the opportunity for us to just come and worship you, to come and hear from you this morning, God, to have our needs met through you, God. Lord, we pray that this morning you would just continue, that you would open your word to us, or we pray that you we would not leave this place the same as when we enter, that we would leave this place full of your spirit, full of your purpose, full of the joy and the hope to take to the world around us, God. Lord, continue to speak to us today. We thank you for being here. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome, Anchor Chapel. We're glad that you made it today. We're excited that you're here with us. It's a great morning. Whether you're here with us today here in the house or whether you're here with us online, it's an awesome day to be worshiping the risen Savior. You know, we talk about our purpose here, our, our vision as a church is to have this, to tell the world about the hope for every soul. We want to make sure it's not a hope, it's the hope, it's that Jesus is the hope of the world. Jesus is the hope for every soul. And so that's why we're here today. We want, to, we want you to know that purpose and that freedom that you can have in Jesus. And so that, that's our goal, that's our, that's our hope for you today. If you're a guest with us today and you haven't, you haven't checked us out before, you haven't had the opportunity yet, in the, in the seat back pocket in front of you, there's a card that you can fill out with just some information 
It's so that we can follow up with you through the week. We want to be able to reach out and see how we might be able to, to minister to you, to, to encourage you, and how we might be able to get you plugged in to where you can be a part of what we're doing. We don't want you to just be here and just come in and leave. We want to know you. We want to be a part of your life. We want to, we want to grow together in what God's trying to do in our lives. And so if you'll take that card, you can fill it out. At the end of the service, you take it to the table in the back. They have a gift for you. They want to give you to, to welcome you, to thank you for being here today. If you'll do that, we'd appreciate it. Maybe you've been here a few times and you're like, okay, so I'm coming and you say you want to, like, we want to get to know each other. But how do we do that? Like, I haven't figured out how to get to know people. You probably need to check out Anchor Groups. Anchor Groups is the place where we hang out during the week. We get together, we eat sometimes, we just, like, talk and, you know, do fun stuff. And then we open the word and we start to dig into what God wants to do in our lives throughout the week and continue to encourage each other. So that's the place to get to know people. That's the place where you can make this connection something personal for you. Hey, this morning, we want you to take a minute. We want you to get to know someone around you for like 20 seconds. So not too deep, but I want you to reach, walk around, welcome somebody, tell them you're glad they're here. Tell them you like their shoes. Then we'll check out Anchor Life. Jesus is the hope for every soul. If this is your first or second time with us, we couldn't be happier you're here. And today we know that you'll hear a message that will strengthen your relationship with God. But before we get to that, let's check out what's going on in the life of Anchor Chapel this week. Hey Anchor, this Wednesday night is Wide Open Wednesday. It's one of my favorite things that we do as a church. And one of those reasons is because like it's called Wide Open Wednesday, anything can happen. It's always a night of powerful worship and ministry. And sometimes it's teaching, sometimes it's discussion, but it is a powerful night. You don't want to miss this Wednesday night, 6.30, right here. We'll see you guys here. When Senya and I first came to Anchor Chapel years ago, it wasn't long at all before Josh and Brooke and so many members of the A-team were eager to give us opportunities to serve. But an important part of starting that journey was going through Anchor Next, and let me tell you, it's just great. Anchor Next is a classroom setting where you discover the heart of the house of Anchor Chapel and get to know ways that you can serve that are personal to you. For me, it opened the doors of serving in everything from photography to singing on stage to preaching, and I'm so excited to see what it'll mean for you. So if you haven't gone through Anchor Next yet, I encourage you to do so at the next opportunity, and you won't regret it. When a believer in Jesus is baptized, they are boldly stating they are followers of Jesus. Their old life is going away, and they're risen to new life. If you haven't been baptized yet, there's a chance coming up real soon. You can go to anchorchapel.com or sign up at the Connections Desk. When you make a decision to give to Anchor Chapel, you're making an impact not only in Baton Rouge, but all around the world. If you're not yet giving and you'd like to know how, we've made it very simple. You can give online, by text, or by placing your gift in the give box on your way out. Thanks again for your generosity. So that's what's going on in the life of Anchor Chapel this week. If you're interested in finding out more information, visit our website, anchorchapel.com, or follow us on all social media at Anchor Chapel. Also, while you're here, check in on Facebook and let us know about your experience. Have a good week. Peace. Well, good morning, Anchor. Man, it's good to be in the house of God. Am I right? It's, uh, what a powerful morning, man. I just... Like, if there's a passion, I think I mentioned this last week, but if there's, if there's an expectation that you come in, it changes the whole atmosphere. It changes everything. And I think that we're all responsible for the personal hunger and the desire in all of us. You get out of any church experience, any small group, anything that you go into at any time, you're reading the Bible on your own, you get out of it what you put into it. And I just think that in these moments, we come and we're ready to meet God. And I think God will do a fresh work. So you guys ready for the word of God today? Yeah. So what we're going to do today is we're starting a brand new series called Found, because traditionally in most churches coming out of the summertime, going into uh, the fall, you're going to see maybe a little bit of an uptick in attendance, and what we are, what we want to do, I'll just be open with you, I'm not trying to like pull a wool over your eyes, I want to, I want to reignite our passion for the loss during this series, because I want us to talk about the fact that there are people that Jesus is trying to reach, and he chooses for some weird reason, he chooses to use us. He's left the responsibility of growing his global church in our hands, and he wants us to have a passion for the lost like he does. So we're calling this series Found, and we're going to talk really about what, what is God's heart for people who don't know Jesus. Today I'm going to start off and I'm going to talk about this 
story of a man named Zacchaeus. And then we're going to look at the rest of the series. We're going to be looking at, at three stories that are told in Luke 15 about just the heart of the Father for lost people. And he uses three different examples that we'll talk about in this series. So I, it's going to be a powerful series. I'm excited about it. Um, but in this first series, I just wanted to talk about, in this first message of the series, I wanted to talk to you about, about the fact that we are lost. The fact that without Christ, every one of us are lost. And there's a tendency in culture right now, there's a lot of, you will hear that everybody is okay where they are. As long as they believe something, as long as they're confident where they are, you're fine if you're just happy with, with, with your life. But, this, but the scripture tells us a different story, that without Christ, every person is lost. No matter your confidence level, every person without Jesus is, is lost for eternity. So we need to... This needs to be a reality for us. And I think about this often when I've joined. I try to think about how God feels about people who are lost. A couple of uh, years ago, this was early 2018, I think we went to Dis uh, Disney with our family. So Brooke's parents came, my parents came, uh, we, a couple of our, my, uh, my, my nieces and nephews came. So we're at Disney World. And if you're at Disney, uh, one of the things that they do every single day is they do this huge fireworks show at night. So we're there, and we're watching this fireworks show. We're on Main Street, and this is, this is the angle I was at. So this is a photo I captured that night. We're watching the fireworks. Let me just kind of set up what happened at this show. So we're there, and my, my family's there. My parents are there. Brooke's parents are there. And Brooke decides it is... Uh, in January at that time of the year, it's Judah's birthday. So, so Brooke said, I'm going to go run into the, one of the gift shops and I'm going to buy Judah a gift. So she, so she says, she tells me I've got my camera around my neck. When I go on a family vacation, I'm taking photos the whole time. And I, I totally missed that she said this. She said, Judah is with you. You watch him. I'm going to the store to buy a gift. So the stroller's right in front of me. Judah's sitting in it, and I have the camera around my neck, and apparently I said, okay, I got Judah, something along those lines. So I'm there, and like all the fireworks start going off, and I'm like, I'm just like taking photos, you know, um, and I'm just like, like, this is such a cool, you know, this is beautiful. I've got such a great angle. Everybody's looking at it. We're all wowed by the fireworks. And then a little bit later, you know, I'm kind of going through my camera photos, and I'm looking down, and I'm like, I've got a stroller in front of me, but there's no kid in it. Like, what am I doing with a show? Where's Judah? You know, like all this stuff starts going through your head. So I grabbed my dad who's next to me, and I said, Dad, did you see Judah? Do you have him? And he's like, no, I don't have him. So we're like, well, who has Judah? So I'm like, was I supposed to have Judah? So like I text Brooke, and I'm like, you have Judah, right? And she's like, all caps, you know, like, no, I don't have Judah. I told you to keep him. So I'm rushing, I'm turning around, and I go to Ernest, to Brooke's dad, and I'm like, do you have Judah? Because I'm thinking he loves his pop. I'm like, maybe you ran, ran to him. He doesn't have Judah. Nobody has Judah. We're in a sea of, I don't know, however many 15 million people you can put in <laughs> Disney at a time. But we're in this sea of people at night, and my son is gone. I don't have him, and Brooke doesn't have him. Let me tell you what happened in that moment. Fireworks were still going off. Everybody was still excited. All this stuff was still happening. The show was still happening. What I did not do is say, let's hold off a second. Let me get a few more pictures because this is a pretty great show. I did not lift the camera back up and start taking a few more photos. What happened is my body temperature changed. I started to freak out. I started like frantically running around looking for my son. So I'm like, pushing old ladies out the way, you know, I'm just like, my son is lost. So I'm running through this crowd, I'm trying to find him, and what's crazy is we were panicking so much, all of us, that someone came to us. They came to us and they were like, did you lose a son? And I was like, how could you tell? All the cursing, what was it? And, and like they found, they found us and they said, did you lose a son? I said, yes. They said, well, he's over here. They brought us to the central spot right between Brooke and I. We're coming, she's coming out of the store and I'm coming towards her and there's someone that's holding Judah's hand a Disney worker has Judah and like there and he's crying his eyes out what happened is the moment Brooke left apparently he liked her more than me so he was like I'd rather be with mom he just took off didn't tell her didn't tell me didn't tell anybody he just took off and you know it would be really easy for some people I guess you would you would want to blame the kid why'd you do that why'd you take off and what I love about what, what Jesus does is he reminds us in Scripture, and he reminds us that lost people just do what lost, what lost people do. That they're going to make stupid decisions. And sometimes we, we think people had it coming, or people deserve where they're headed, or all of these. We have all these excuses. But when the father loses a son, all he cares about is getting the son back. 
And I think back to that story about how panicked I was in that moment. And Brooke had said to me later, if we talked about it, she said, things would have changed between us. You know, like, like think about it, you lose a kid and I'm responsible for losing our kid. Like, like she's like, I don't know if our marriage would have made it. You know, like, like that's, a hard, that's a hard thing that you would have to endure because losing your kid, it's a major deal. And if you don't have a kid today, maybe, you're, maybe you don't really get it yet, but that's something that it dramatically changes everything. When someone is lost and you're the parent, everything changes to find the kid. Yeah. And we're found. Those of you who know Christ, you're found and you're like, sometimes we can be, I'm good in my spot. But what I hope that this series does is it reminds us of the father's aching heart for the lost that his children are still running around trying to find life and purpose and meaning in all of these other things. And he's telling us to go on a search, find the lost, help me to reach them, help me to bring them back to me. That's the goal of what this whole series is, that we would help people to be found in Jesus. So Luke 19, we're going to look at the story of this guy named Zacchaeus. And if you grew up in church, you've heard this story all growing up, and it's, a, you know, it's kind of a funny story on some levels, but it's, it is a story that reveals to us the heart of the Father for the lost. So Luke 19, verse 1. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There's a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector of that region. And he had become very rich. We tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So we ran ahead, climbed the sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus, and he called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down, and he took Jesus to his house with great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He's gone to the guest of a, of a notorious sinner. They grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half of my wealth to the, to the poor, Lord. And if I have cheated them on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, Salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are, what? Lost. The purpose of Jesus was to come and seek and save the lost. What Jesus left us with was to seek and save the lost. I want to look at this story. This is a fascinating story to me, and there's all kinds of things in here that we're going to try to open up in the few minutes that we have left. So Zacchaeus, it says, it describes him as a chief tax collector, which means basically it's code for he's the ultimate sleazeball. He's the guy who would take advantage of everyone. A tax collector or a publican would be someone who was for the government, would collect, tax, collect taxes, but there was no accountability to what they did. So it was very common practice, and it even proved, even by the way that Zacchaeus responded to Jesus inviting him, that he was this kind of guy. That he would tell someone, you came to pay your taxes to Caesar, and he would say, and he would see on the ledger, oh, this person owns 20,000 shekels of taxes this year, and you would tell the person instead of 20,000 he'd say you owe 35,000 shekels this year and he would keep everything off the top he would just skim it off the top so everybody hated tax collectors because they were cheaters and they robbed people and they became rich off of the people's off of the people's finances so they would constantly be doing this and they were people who had even though they were there to serve the people they had forgotten the needs of the people they didn't care about the people and they became elevated in power and authority and money and all of these things so everybody would look at them and hate them actually it was so it was such a disgusting job that a rabbi wouldn't even share the road with the publican with the tax collector. They wouldn't even share the road with them. They'd see them coming down, they'd take a detour, or maybe there was a road that, ta that tax collectors would travel on and rabbis would take a different road. I'm not even going to be in the same company. I'm not going to be seen anywhere near you. But Jesus did something completely different. Instead of avoiding him at all costs, Jesus is getting all up in his business. Jesus is getting as close to him as possible. It's crazy. And, and, you know, there's a few different details about this story that really stand out. It says that Zacchaeus was too short to see over the crowd. Now, it might just be that there were a lot of tall people in front of him. But what I learned in Sunday school was that he was a short guy. I always thought of Danny DeVito when I'm thinking of, of Zacchaeus, you know. It's like some of you know what I'm talking about. Where's all my short people at? Raise your hand real quick. Oh, I can't see your hands. Can you? Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Had to, had to do it. Okay, so Zacchaeus, but what's interesting about Zacchaeus, it says that he climbed this tree to what? To get a look at Jesus. It doesn't say anything about Zacchaeus wanting to follow Jesus. But what I think that Zacchaeus understood is that there was something Jesus had that I need. 
there's something about this Jesus that I keep hearing about that is absent from my life. So I've got to at least get a look, a, get a, I've got to get a good look. But there's a huge difference between following Jesus and, and just getting a good look, right? If you're taking notes, here's the first thing I want you to write down. Observing Jesus isn't the same thing as following Jesus. And you might think, oh, that's good. But do you do that? Are you observing? Do you come in today and you're like, man, that was a cool moment. That was a great moment. I love that. that was, it made me feel good. And while the Holy Spirit does do things in our feelings and he changes the way we feel and none of that's wrong, if, 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 if all that happens is your feelings get excited, you're not following Jesus. Yeah. Because you're going to, if you live a life of pain and suffering because of the gospel, then you're probably following Jesus. But there was a calling that he's calling us out of our comfort to follow him. So Zacchaeus didn't necessarily want all that. He's just like, Jesus has something that I don't, I don't really know what it is but I need what he has. Yeah. So, but here's the thing that you've got to understand. The hope for our souls isn't in seeing Jesus, but it's in, it's in knowing Jesus. It's in knowing who he is. And what I love about Jesus is that he pursues me even when I don't really want him. You know, he's done that for all of us. Even when I don't even know how much I need him, still pursues me. Even when I don't realize that I'm lost, he still pursues me. And that's what Jesus does in this story with Zacchaeus. What's crazy about this is it says that Zacchaeus, um, Jesus called Zacchaeus by name. Now, this is very ironic because the word Zacchaeus, if you know your Greek, which I didn't, I had to look it up, but Zacchaeus, the name Zacchaeus means pure and innocent. Isn't it fascinating? All of his life, all of his professional life, people treated him as the opposite because he was the opposite. But Jesus called him by name. Because what I think that Jesus is trying to do in him and what he's trying to do in us is he's trying to call things that are not as though they are. He's trying to say things to us that ignite a passion of purpose in us. He's trying to say, this is who I see you to be. This is who I'm calling you to be. This is what I have for you. You, you haven't been looking like a Zacchaeus, but I'm calling you a Zacchaeus. You haven't been acting like a Zacchaeus, but I'm going to call you by that because I see it in you. Even if nobody else sees it in you, I see it in you. Here's the second thing you need to write down. Only Jesus can turn ironic into identity. It's so ironic that Zacchaeus' name is Zacchaeus. He's pure and he's innocent. Everybody thought it was a joke, but Jesus. And I wonder how many of us, you even think you're a joke. There's been a label put on you. There's been a history put on you. Maybe something that you just completely, you dove into it head first and you put it on yourself. But no matter who you are today, Jesus is trying to call something out of you that is supposed to be. Not necessarily who we are yet, but Jesus is trying to make us, as we learn to follow him, he's trying to say, listen, if you give your life for my sake, I promise you, you'll become something that you never thought you could be. Yeah. Not only will you become free, but you'll have purpose. You'll have a reason to get up in the morning. You will have a, a name that I give you that nobody else can say anything against. Isn't it funny that like his name was pure and innocent and everybody thought it was a joke? But whenever God gives his identity to us, like no matter what we come from, people can't argue with it. People can't. They're just like, I don't know why. I, that person does not deserve all that. That person doesn't deserve to be that good or to have that kind of impact or to have that favor. But for some reason, there's something on them. There's something inside of that person that is helping them out. And it's the Spirit of God. When we allow him to come in, it just cha it transforms everything. So Jesus calls him by name. I love that because he saw that he was lost, but he needed to be somebody else. And what, what's really cool about this, too, is that Jesus initiated the finding. Zacchaeus was curious but Jesus initiated it. Zacchaeus is looking, but Jesus says, you, I'm going to your house today. And what, I, and what I think it does for me is it reminds me that I'm not just going to be waiting for these moments that God drops in my lap, but I'm going to try to create some of those moments. Brooke and I have been talking about how to be evangelistic lately, and it's like it's challenging us because sometimes the easy thing is that God would just lay right in front of you this perfect example. Brooke, the other day, she's been talking to her hairdresser for a couple of years about the gospel, and then the other day she goes, and the hairdresser says, what is, so what does it mean to be saved? And she's like, whoa, this is like a perfect moment. Like, this is just a moment where God laid it out. Well, we think, like, if that happens, then I'll do it. If that happens, then I'll. But we're responsible for finding the lost, too. We're responsible to do something even when it doesn't just drop in our lap. We're responsible to go after those people. And what's crazy is Jesus says, not only, do, not only is he calling out Zacchaeus, come and follow me, but he says, you know what? I'm going to go to your house. I'm going to get in your business. What I love about this is, is Jesus was willing to go to where the lost were. 
That's why we started our church at the Varsity Theater. We always want to be a church that is willing to go where the lost are. That we don't want people to have to jump through hoops and say, what do we have to learn to fit in? What, what do we have to do again to be a part of this, this club? It's not about that, but instead it's who's lost, we're going to go find them. Who's lost, we're going to just love them right where they are and, and just say, you know what, all the walls that we could easily put up as a church, we're going to just break all that down, make it simple, like Jesus loves you, so we're going to love you. And that's what Jesus did. He just went to the lost and he went to Zacchaeus and he said, I'm going to your house. I mean, how many of you would freak out if Jesus was like, I'm going to your house today? How many of you are thinking about your living room right now, the state of your living room, and you're like, ain't nobody coming over for a while. It's going to take me a good solid two hours to clean that thing up. But he just says, Zacchaeus, I'm going to your house. And what I love about what Zacchaeus probably understood is I'm so lost, it doesn't matter if I don't have time to clean up my living room. And, and Jesus wasn't offended by the state of, where he, of his house. This was a spur-of-the-moment thing. And I think that as a church, we've got, to do a, we've got to be really faithful with the idea that we don't have to require people to get their house in order before they, before they invite Jesus in. So like if someone meets Jesus, it takes a while for someone to experience what the Bible calls sanctification, this process of growth. So are you okay as a church member? Are you okay with a lost looking person? The only church says stuff like that. Are you okay with someone coming through the doors that looks like they had a rough night last night? that looks like they're just going to go back to it again this week? That someone who's living like they're lost and they don't even care? Are you okay with that person coming and finding a home here? Because Jesus seemed to be okay with going in their mix. Now, of course, when the Spirit of God gets a hold of somebody, it's going to transform them, but that's the Spirit of God's job. So we let him do that, and it's our job to just love the lost right where they are. And what I love about this, it says that, it says that people were displeased. Everybody was upset. Everybody was mad that Jesus went to his house. Are you, a dis, are you displeased when the lost come through our doors? Are you just, does it throw like a, like a wrench in, in the socket? Does it, uh, or does it throw a, a stick in the spokes? You ever did that whenever you were a kid? We used to do that. You'd be riding a bike and like, so, like your brother just ride down the street and you're like, check this out, just throw a broomstick in the front wheel. Yeah, it just like messes everything up. But like some of us, lost people getting in your mix, lost people are going to your anchor group, lost people coming into the church, that's gonna mess everything up. Man, I gotta do like, I gotta like try to help somebody. I got, they, don't have, they don't have enough money. I got to meet a need. They, they got these prayer things. They, they're like, they still on this stuff. They still, they still like wasting their life away. I don't have time for this. Like we're growing. We're going deeper. I just, I'm going to leave them behind. You ain't going deeper. You're just getting religious. If Jesus calls us. If we go deeper, we should go out. We should go wider as we're going deeper. So the more that we get to know the heart of God, the more we realize we've got to expand. We've got to reach the people that Jesus is trying to reach. Here's the last point that you're going to write down. If you're, if you're displeased with someone finding the lost, you're not following Jesus. You're just, you're just doing this church thing. You become a Pharisee. The Pharisees were displeased. The people that were meant to shepherd the lost and to bring people in, they're the ones who were upset. And Jesus is like, I'm going to hit reset on this whole thing because you missed the whole point. I'm all about the lost. And I love how it says, meanwhile, Zacchaeus is already getting sanctified. He's like, I'm going to just return taxes. I'm going to just start, I'm going to start giving people money. He's like, like, he don't even know. He don't even look at his bank account. He's just like, you know what? He said, I had an encounter with Jesus. I'm going to change it all. I'm going to start giving people money. Everything's, and like that one encounter with Jesus started changing everything. Don't, don't, don't underestimate what Jesus can do in one, in one moment. Sometimes it'd be like, you know, like people will come in and we're like, we'll put a time limit on stuff and be like, well, they can't really serve in the church until they've been in church for a year because there's no way they can really grow and be discipled and, and whatever. Some people who are newly saved are more Christian than you are. Like if you, some, some of us be in the church for so long, you forget what it means to reach the lost, you're missing the whole point. And I'm talking to myself too. I love doing church and I love doing churchy things. And sometimes I can forget the lost. I can forget that there are people who are dying in their sin without the hope of the, of the gospel. And I need to be awakened. We all need to be awakened here. Seek and save the lost. That's the mission that's left to us. People aren't just on like some other journey without Jesus. There's all this language, you know, like, oh, that's their journey. That's where they're going. You know, they're just finding peace somewhere else. No, they aren't. It's temporary, if it's anything. The Bible says this in Revelation 3, verse 17. You say, he's talking to this church, church of this town called Laodicea. And he says, this church was an arrogant church that thought that they were okay, but they'd forgotten about Jesus, their first love. In verse 17, you say, I'm rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. 
and you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. We can't fall for the lie that people put out sometimes, that it's like, oh, I'm good, I'm fine, I'm happy, I'm fulfilled, I'm already part of this thing, I'm a part of some spiritual journey, I try it all, I try all kinds of things. People without Jesus, wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked, we're lost without Christ. We need Jesus. Whenever people ask me for direction, sometimes I act like it's a big inconvenience, you know? You ever, like, go somewhere, and you're, like, in the city, and somebody's, like, comes up to you, and you're, like, they're, like, hey, how do you get to the Civic Center? How do you get to, how do you get to the River Center or whatever, you know? And you're, like, man, like, you don't have maps on your phone? Like, go find out for yourself. <laughs> like, you, like, you don't want to help somebody out, you know? It's, like, such an inconvenience today, because it's, like, everybody can find their own way. Everybody has their own way of finding out stuff. Like, why you got to ask me? And we have that tendency to think, everybody's going to be okay. They'll find their own way. They'll, they'll, they'll discover. Like, Jesus will get them. He's using us to get them. Yeah. He's trying to use us to seek and save the lost. Yeah. It's our responsibility. Like, we're the ones who give directions. But we get all mad, and we're like, what, Google's broken? Like, you can't find out yourself? But, the, but our spirit needs to be the same as Christ. Yeah. Have, have, and here's a question for you. Just personally, have the lost become an inconvenience to you? Because it takes up, it takes some time, it takes some effort, it takes, it takes a different heart perspective to think about and to seek and save the lost. And obviously, we're not the ones who do the saving. We point them to Christ. We point them to Jesus. But are we doing that? Is that an inconvenience? Is that part of the, of the journey of part of our responsibility and inconvenience? Acts 4.12 says this, and we'll start wrapping up in a second. It gives us this clear picture of who Jesus is. There is salvation in no one else God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. It's in Jesus and Jesus alone. There, there's no other religion. There's no other journey of spirituality that saves people. It's in Jesus and Jesus only that anyone is saved. But I think that the idea that many Christians have is that people will figure it out. You're okay. I don't want to offend anybody. And we'll talk about that in a couple weeks about actually speaking to the lost, how to, how to invite someone into relationship with Jesus, or at the very least, invite someone into the church. But I think that the, one of the problems is that the church doesn't look at people as lost. The church doesn't look at lost people as lost. We think everybody's okay, and it's kind of, I saw this meme the other day about, this is kind of like what it looks like whenever people are drowning in their sin. We're like, we're like, you know, we're reaching, and we're like, you know what? You're actually doing pretty good. And we just say congratulations on your faith journey, whatever that means, while people are drowning in their sin. If you don't know how to clearly articulate the gospel and people's need for Jesus, then you have to go and do some homework. It's part of what it means to be a Christian. What saved you? How did you get saved? I mean, do you even know what you believe? If you can't articulate it, do you believe it? Do you even know it? This is part of what it means to be a Christian, that we would, like Jesus came to do, to seek and to save the lost that we're not looking at it as an inconvenience, but instead, this is my purpose. This is why I'm here. And I'm asking the band to come up, and we're going to wrap up in just a second. One more verse, though, in 2 Thessalonians 7. And here's what I want to do. I want us to, you know, there's verses like this. This is one of those verses that people will read, and they'll just be like, I don't want to talk about it. I'm going to skip this in my Bible reading. But this is the truth of what the Word of God says about eternity. And God will provide rest for you who are being persecuted, and also for us when the Lord Jesus appears from heaven. He will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who don't know God and on those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with eternal destruction, forever separated from the Lord and his glorious power. Now, I read that verse, and I'll be honest with you, I don't like reading that verse. I don't like reading it to you. I don't like the idea that someone could be in the room or someone watching online and think, oh, that's a fire and brimstone church. Because we all grew up, if you grew up in the church and you grew up in the 80s, you got a lot of that. I got a lot of that. I remember feeling so guilty. I was a Christian. I'm going to church and I felt guilty. I was like, the fire and brimstone was reserved for me, I thought. And I'm a, I'm a Jesus follower. But I remember feeling such shame and such fear all the time. And I think what, what televangelists and evangelists in the 80s, they, I think they maybe have misdirected that fear to Christians when it should have been something that awakened us to care for and love the lost. And now every generation swings to the opposite side to overcorrect 
because they see something they didn't like the way they grew up. And I think this generation has swung too far in the opposite direction. We've gone away from fire and brimstone, which was never God's plan either. But we have gone so far in the opposite direction that everybody's fine. Everybody's okay. And as Christians, because we keep our mouths shut, people are missing an opportunity to be saved. Now, I do believe that Jesus is the one responsible for getting the attention of someone. Someone's responsibility for salvation may not be solely in your hands, but when you're given the opportunity, we should not blow it. I believe that Jesus will, he'll get the attention of someone who's running and says no, and people can, we can blow it and he can still get what he wants. But he is asking us to play a part in this story, in this salvation story. And the reality is that people are lost and there is an eternal destruction that people are headed for without Jesus. So our responsibility should be, I wanna love the lost as much as God does. And if we start there, it's a good place to start. We might not know all the things to say. You might feel like you botched the salvation story or whatever. Just start with, I'm gonna love people and care about people like God does. So what I wanted to do today, I felt like the Spirit of God was leading us to do something that's a, it's a Bible term, but to stand in the gap for people. And this is, um, it's a story in, in Ezekiel 22 where God is speaking a prophetic word of judgment against Israel unless righteous people would stand up and fill the gaps of the wall of righteousness that protected um, Israel. So he says in, that, in the prophecy that I need some good people to stand up and stand in the gap of the wall of righteousness. Now, Jesus is the one who ultimately stood in the gap. We don't, we don't pay for anyone. We don't, we're not righteous to get anybody else saved. But the symbolism is there, that we would be bridges for people to find Jesus, that we would help people to find Christ, that we could stand in the gap for people who aren't here today who haven't heard this message, who won't, won't listen online, that we would stand up and we would say, I'm thinking of someone. There's someone that I know at my workplace or someone that I see every day at the coffee shop or a family member, there's someone who's sitting next to me, whatever it is, that does not know Christ. And I wanna pray for them. I wanna pray that God would give me a heart for the lost. So I'm gonna ask, we're all gonna stand up and we're gonna pray a prayer of salvation in a second, just a prayer of repentance before Christ. But what I wanna do in this moment is I want, I want those of us who know lost people, and it should be a lot of us, but I want us to physically do something. And we're gonna just go into just a, just a couple minutes of intercession and standing in the gap for people. So if you say, I know someone who doesn't know Christ and I wanna pray for them today, I'm gonna to ask you to stand up here. This will be our fake, this will be our gap today. And I want you to say, and this is, and it's important that you respond and you do something. Because you can be lazy and sit there and be like, I'm gonna say a little prayer. I want you to be accountable to everybody else in this room. I want everybody in this room to see you come up and for somebody to ask you next week, hey, who are you praying for? Can I pray for you with them? Can I pray, can I pray alongside of you? So who do you know that's lost that you need to stand in the gap for today? Today is a moment that we pray for those who don't know Christ. There's thousands of Zacchaeuses all over the city with potential that are squandering it right now, but they just, they just don't know. They don't know Jesus. We do. So we're called to help. We're called to stand in the gap. So come and stand in the gap right now. Just walk up here. Who do you know? Stand in the gap for somebody. And what I want to do, we're going to pray. And I want you to just speak their name to Jesus. We're going to pray, and I don't care how you pray. I don't care if you're comfortable with lifting your hands or, you know, do whatever you want. But this moment, it's not, it's not about us at all. If it is at all about us, it's just about, God, give me your heart for the lost. What it's really about is, Jesus, call them to you right now. Just pray it right now. Jesus, call them to you. Lord, you see every lost person that's represented in the room by this response. You see every single person right now that we're thinking of, that we have been aching over, that we're concerned about, that maybe we haven't ached enough over. I pray that you would awaken our heart, awaken our passion for the lost. Lord, that you would give us a desire to see those that are lost to be found. 
God, do it in us. But right now, Lord, we direct our attention right now to those people, to the lost, to the individuals that we're thinking of right now. Lord, we, we direct our attention to them and we ask right now, Holy Spirit, reach them. Reach them right where they are. If they're at home right now, if they're in this room or wherever they are, if they're watching online or whatever it is, Lord, you know where every person is. So we pray that now you would begin that work. Reach their heart in Jesus' name. We're just going to play music for a second, and I don't want to pray for you. You pray on your own. You pray. You lift up a song to God. You lift up a prayer to God on their behalf. Let's stand in the gap. We lift up every person right now, every name that was lifted up to you. And we ask right now that by your spirit, you would get a hold of their heart. You would help them to see their emptiness, their lostness, that they're poor, blind, and naked, and cold without you. Lord, I just pray in Jesus' name that you would reveal to them what only you can, that there is a need in them for you, that you are what they've been looking for. And Lord, I pray for every person that has responded here, that's watching online, that is praying for someone else. Lord, are we standing in the gap? We are standing in the gap for them, and we say, Lord, if we're the tool, if we're the avenue that the gospel will flow through to reach them, let it be so. Do it in us. Do it through us. Lord, I pray that you would give us confidence like we've never had before. Give us a boldness to proclaim the gospel, that we would love the lost like you do. Lord, help us to first see people that don't know you where the, who, as they really are, lost and in need of a father, wandering sheep in need of a shepherd. Lord, I thank you that you're doing a good work right now in the church. Give us a passion for the loss in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Before you head back to your seat, I just want to give anybody an opportunity, if you're in the room or if you're joining us on the line and you don't know Jesus and you would say, I am that lost person. I'm that person who's been looking all over the place for life, for hope, for meaning. Today's the day I feel the Spirit of God tugging on my heart. One time I, I preached a message and this student came up to me after and he said, I felt like if I didn't pray that prayer you were talking about, that my heart would have blown up. That my heart was on fire. And if I didn't do it, then I would have missed out on that moment and that would have been it. Right now, there's somebody that's listening and your heart's on fire. Today's the day to respond to Jesus. So we're all gonna pray this prayer together, just a prayer of humility before him saying, I need you and I choose to follow you. Let's say this together. Let's say, Lord Jesus, I recognize my need for you today. I'm a sinner. And I know you want to be my Savior. I know you're the perfect Son of God. You came to this earth, lived a perfect life, but you died a sinner's death on a cross. My death on the cross. But then you were risen again to give me and humanity new life. So today I choose to follow you. I give you my life, my past, my present, and my future. It's all yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, man. Let's praise Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You're so good. Okay, I have to change gears. I'm so, I didn't think about this logistically, but can you just go back to your seats real quick? We're going to change gears real quick. This feels like a wide open Wednesday. It's a little too loosey-goosey. Which, by the way, come to Wide Open Wednesday this Wednesday. It's amazing. So what we're going to do today, what I really wanted to do, you know, we're going into a new school year. I know that you, we've been having so much fun this summer, and uh, you kind of, like, forget about you've got, like, a, you've got school to go back to if you're a kid or if you're a, a student or, or if you're a teacher even. So what I wanted to do in this moment, I wanted to invite the children in. So we've got all the children are going to come in right now. So we've got kids ministry going to come in. They're going to come and line up right here. And as they're coming up, what I wanted to do is I just wanted to take a moment and just as a church that we would bless every, every kid, every college student or high school student, and every faculty member that is going back to school this year. We want to pray a prayer of blessing over them. So, hi kids, how y'all doing? 
Hi, oh my gosh, Wonder Woman's here today. That's awesome. So I want us to do this, church. So as the kids are coming up, we're going to pray over the kids. Um, if you are a college student, a high school student, if you're a faculty member, you're going back to school and it's about to get real for you, can you just lift your hand too? You're working in education, you're going, you're going to be learning education, whatever, the, right now. If you just lift your hand, everybody else, either put your hand on somebody or lift your hands toward these kids. And let's pray a prayer of blessing over everyone going back to school. Jesus, we are so grateful that even in something like education system, or do you choose to release us into the wild to be a light in the darkness? So Lord, I pray that you would do a couple things as we go back to school. Lord, we pray for favor when it comes to learning. We pray that every child would be alert this year. Every student would be focused so that they can learn and grow and not get caught up and, and not be not be derailed and not be thrown off course and all the stuff that the enemy would try to do to derail our purpose. We pray for that. But even more than that, Lord, we pray that from the youngest to the oldest, from the kids that are in school to the students that are in college to all the faculty members that are represented here, as we go, we pray that you would activate us this year, that you would activate our faith that we would see where we're going as the mission field. Lord, that you would help every person to understand that we are a light in the darkness. We are a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. So we make a decision not to put our light under a basket, but instead to put it on a stand so that everyone can see it. Lord, we pray for favor in relationships. Lord, we pray that as people see us, that they would see something different in us and they would cause questions to come out and that people would be able to point our friends and our, our students and everyone that we're gonna be around this next school year, point them to Jesus. Lord, I thank you that you are activating everyone here in this room to make a difference on their campus, in their school, in Jesus' name. We thank you for that favor. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. Hey, as you're, as you're about to take off, remember just a couple things that are really pretty big deals. This Wednesday night, we're having a wide open Wednesday, which is here, which is night where anything can happen. We worship and we pray. And then, by the way, y'all, Senior Gas is bringing the word this Wednesday night. I love it when we, we get opportunity to give someone an opportunity to let their gift shine. So, man, come out this Wednesday night, 6.30. It's going to be awesome. Also, today, right after this, in just about 10 minutes, in Pier 16, we're having Anchor Next. If you've been wanting to connect to the church, want to know how you can fit in, how God can use your gifting to make a difference in the world and in this community, go to Anchor Next. you find out a little bit about the church, a lot about yourself. You want to be connected to that, so that's going to be at 12 o'clock. Free lunch. It's going to be awesome. Hey, great clock. Good job on that clock. She's showing me. Or she's hiding her face from the lights. Okay. We we'll love you guys. Thank you all so much for coming. You guys are the light of the world. Light it up this week. Tell somebody about Jesus, and we'll see you all here next Sunday. Be blessed.